because you all gave like really, really, you know, great, really interesting responses on Donna Harway's article on the Cyborg Manifesto. And I knew really we should go on to immediately to the section of cyber sex, on cyber sex. But I thought it would be very, I just felt sort of like it was important to talk about one other perspective in this cyber feminism perspective, and that's to talk about Sadie Plant's perspective on cyber feminism. And as Ted described it very well, so as I said, well, Sadie Plant has like a really strong perspective on the question of cyber feminism, and she does has less, a little less of the ambiguity of uh, Donna Haraway. And she, as Ted says, yeah, when you read Sadie Plant, you know, her writing really provides you a sort of a jolt. But then Ted said, well, it's sort of like a healthy jolt in some ways. So I'd like to go through her thought, because I think she's asking a really fundamental question, or her thought raises a fundamental question. It's a question which is then raised, continues in the section on cyber sex. Like, and I'd like in that section to focus on two articles in particular, Nina Wakeford's uh, Cyber Queer and Ramda Woodland's Queer Spaces and Modem Boys and pagan statues, gay, lesbian uh, yeah, identity, and cyberspace itself. And just remember, just a little note, that Nina Wakeford, when she says cyberqueer, when the word queer is used in these discussions, it's not a pejorative term. It's, in fact, you know, a self-descriptive term of the culture itself. And it's claiming a certain kind of space for gays and lesbians. So I'd like to talk about the, you know, we can talk about and we can have a discussion of cybersex itself. But I want to talk, to really begin that section with Sadie Plants, her, uh, contribution to understanding, you know, a, to a feminist understanding of cyberspace. And the reason that I want to do that is because Sadie Plant really puts the question, does technology have a sex? Does the internet have a sex? Because Sadie Plant's perspective basically says that it does. Because her perspective on the internet, she says when the internet develops and when cyberspace develops, it's not, you know, like neutral of questions of gender or sec of questions of sexuality. She says what's really so explosive and so unsettling and so disturbing about the internet, and it's kind of an unrealized possibility, is that it does have a sex, and it turns out that it's not a male sex. It turns out that, in fact, it's feminist. That has a possibility of a female sex that is another way of understanding and experiencing the world itself. So I like just to really put that question, you know, be as faithful as possible to Sadie Plant's thought, you know, really think that through what the implications of that perspective are. And then go on to talk of, uh, you know, like Nina Wakeford and Randa Woodland, who would also argue that, you know, technology has a sex, that sex that there's a particular relationship between cyberspace and gay identity, and particular re real relationship between cyberspace and lesbian identity itself. So I'll do that in just a moment. And be, before I do that, I just want to introduce three uh, just things that happened this week in terms of the question of technology itself, which sort of bear on the discussions that we've had in the class, which is one, remember we started the class and talking about Marshall McLuhan and saying that, you know, the internet, you know, the, for Marshall McLuhan, the notion that technology is in fact, you know, like an extension of the human central nervous system. It remakes the human central nervous system in terms of the world itself. Having closed the door. <laughs> Amy, how are you? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> so, remember Marshall McLuhan says, you know, that the, the world grows another, the human body grows another nervous system, and then we begin to live within this nervous system. He says that that's what electronic technology is. You know, we begin to have like externalized hearing in the form of radio and music. We begin to have externalized eyesight in the form of cinema and television. We begin to have you know, an externalized sense of emotion outside our own body in terms of when we begin to surf the net and you just for moments you go through, you know, or you hear news and you go through like intense moments of like really feeling tragedy, but then you get distracted and then you feel sort of happy or, you know, many other, you know, multitude of feelings itself. Well, it turns out that a company like IBM probably has been uh, reading Marshall McLuhan itself and has decided to do something about it. Because this was reported this week, it says, Computer Fix Thyself is aim of IBM unit. It says, the devilish complexity of computers and worse networks of computers has long been the bane of the engineers who try to keep corporate computer systems up and running. And the complexity has exploded in recent years with the rise of the internet. Now computer scientists are tackling the challenge with new tools and fresh thinking. One approach is to borrow ideas from biology. The human body, after all, can be seen as a phenomenal processor of informational complexity. The chemical units of DNA, A, G, C, and T, are not so different, really, from the digital codes of ones and zeros. IBM has taken a page from biology with a planned announcement that it's creating a, 
quote, autonomic computing unit. The group will be headed by blah, blah. The autonomic, oh, here's his name, Alan Jenick, former vice president for strategy in the research division. The autonomic computing effort will span the company's hardware, software services, and research operations, and it'll only cost $500 million a year on the initiative. So, pocket change for IBM. The group's goal is to develop technology that will do for the corporate data centers what the autonomic nervous system does for humans. Autonomic automatically handle basic functions like breathing and digestion, or in computing cases, in computing's case, networks that diagnose bugs and fix them automatically in data centers that are automatically figuring out the best way to handle changing workloads. Better hardware designs are part of the answer to overcoming computing complexity, but clever software of various kinds is probably the most important technology. Software that can log a network's behavior and learn from it is one promising area, Mr. Genex said, helping to make systems that are predictive and adaptive. Another important tool will be software that enables people to state business objectives with graphic or text representations, not in a complex programming language, but just have the network figure out how to handle the problem itself. He says all the big vendors are going after the complexity problem, but IBM has been working on this longer and has more researchers focused on this than anyone else. So I found the article really interesting because I thought, well, the theory was in the 1960s was Marshall McLuhan, who really generally had this sense, you know, like this prophetic sense that, you know, the age of electronic information, which is to say the age of computing, <laughs> in fact, does something really fundamental that, I'll leave the door open. It does something, hi. It does something really fundamental that it in fact represents a kind of skin and a kind of nervous system that we set ourselves within. And then you come along like, you know, 40 years later and you have IBM says that's a very good idea. And how in fact using the language, you know, merging the language of biology and computer software, can we in fact make the computer network come alive? Come alive to the extent that it begins to sense in fact fetal breakdowns and problems begin to anticipate kind of learning shifts that it has to do, handle complex data, or begin in fact autonomically to take care of itself. When you have that, when the data center comes alive itself, then you're really sort of not just one step from arti real artificial intelligence, but I think the implication of the article is that you're at the first kind of baby steps towards artificial life itself. Self-generating, self-organizing, autonomically, an autonomic nervous system, you know, flows of data networks that are capable of taking care of themselves outside of human intervention itself. So I'd say that, you know, this is a little article on the business page, but the implication of it is, is really it opens up the question of what constitutes artificial life. And at what point realistically can we say that technology comes alive in the kind of literal sense and secondly, what happens then to the status of the human with respect to the technology itself? We've always viewed ourselves as either smarter than the technology or as really necessary to keep it functioning. When you have a lot of data, when you have data, computing data centers as autonomic nervous systems, when they go on autonomic, automatic pilot, then in fact the human, you know, the necessity for human in intervention then is cast aside. So it really begins to shift basically and destabilize the relationship, I think, between you know human effort and computers themselves, and that's not to close down a discussion, but just to open up, just to say this article opens up a possibility. So that's sort of one, the autonomic nervous system. The second thing, again, in the inf the business pages, was about those war warriors, and I thought it was had this thing had such pathos about it, and at the same time such utopian hopes for the road warriors who are on the road itself. This was adding technology to add new dimensions to the nightly call home. First article says something about, you know, computer data centers, you know, technology itself coming alive. This says, well, what kind of life are we li living? Here's Maura Aspinall. She's a biotechnology executive, and her two sons went over their final report cards last spring. They did it by fax and phone. She was away on a business trip, and the boys faxed the grades to her hotel and then called her to discuss them. She said, it was an important milestone sharing your end of the year report card, said Ms. Aspinall, who travels several days a month as president of two operating divisions of the Genzyme Corporation in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You wouldn't want to miss that or hear about it later. Inspiring by the dizzying array of portable devices on the market and a growing emphasis on home and family after September the 11th, frequent business travelers are taking the traditional nightly call home to new levels. 
Using instant messaging, phone, fax, email, and even video conferencing, travelers are keeping up with home life and sharing virtual family moments from far away. They're reading bedtime stories over the phone from their hotel room or sending digital snapshots of the Paris skyline via email. They're helping with homework by fax and giving teenagers or spouses wake-up calls from hotel business centers. Quote, technology has given me the ability to have life be seamless, said Miss Aspinall, a former management consultant. Well, corporate travel is down, business travelers are traveling all the more. And she says, they ask, she, and the, they then go and interview people doing the hotels and say like a real big demand in hotels that cater to people working in the business technology sectors is in fact to have a lot of fast lines available because people are in fact in business by themselves because they have to be on the road are really trying to create the possibility, like explore the creative possibilities of the virtual family itself. And as one businessman that they said, he in fact has even started bedtime stories for his children in which he talks by email and by video conferencing with his children and then he sits down and he writes out a story incorporating his family and his children into bedtime stories as to what's happening in Paris that day, what's happening in Brussels, what's happening in Antwerp itself. And then he goes on email to them and then he sort of, you know, in video conference, reads the story to them and then they have sort of like this E relationship itself. So that's when I read the story, I thought, well, that's really interesting because, you know, it's like creative exploration of possibilities. At the same time, it seemed to have just my viewpoint, it seems to have like a lot of pathos about it. Because that, well, are they sending maybe the snapshots so you can sort of remember who your children are and what they look like? Because you're really on the road a lot of times and stuff like this, you know? Because the technology is also, what the article doesn't mention, is the technology itself really stressing family life. So again, like a technological innovation with really ambiguous consequences. And this is Google, and the third story is Google would say five minutes ago, but actually I think it's today's story. It's computer screensavers save protein puzzle. And I think it's really phenomenal in terms of, it's just interesting. It says, this is from California, of course, where you know one person is, says Californians are different. They don't have nervous breakdowns. They have nervous breakthroughs. They you know, ascend to sort of a new level. It says thousands of desktop computers have resolved the longstanding biological puzzle in a breakthrough in simultaneous data processing, the British Journal reported Wednesday. A team led by Vilya Pandey of Stanford University in California put out a call in the year 2000 for computer owners to make idle machines available to crack a monster of a problem, how the atoms of a protein cause it to fold into a 3D knot. Understanding this could help drug designers come up with molecules to attack Alzheimer's disease and the human form of mad cow disease, both of which are caused by misfolding rogue proteins. Pandey's project called Folding at Home assembled 200,000 volunteers on the net who each downloaded a program which swung into action after their computer has been idle for a certain time. The software comprised a swirling screensaver and a data analysis program which worked its way through a specific number crunching task set by Folding at Home. When the results were completed, they were then sent back to Folding at Home via the internet. The average daily task set by each computer was to simulate, atom by atom, a millionth of a second of protein folding. In total, it took 2,000 years of computer time to crack the problem. Several super <coughs> supercomputers working together could have addressed the same problem, but it would have taken a lot of more time. These super brains are also very expensive, and scientists usually have limited access to them. It's a big breakthrough. Proteins are sequences of amino acids and not only comprise the body's tissues, but also play the role of builder, repairer, and messenger, teaming up with our proteins to do so. The challenge was huge. He said it was like entering a maze. The molecular backbone can start looping up in numerous different ways, yet most paths lead to dead ends. Folding at home's final simulation about the manner and speed at which the protein folds corresponds tightly with lab measurements. The molecule itself twists at an astonishing speed, just five thousandths of a second. The screensaver technique called distributed computing, coming out of Xerox Park in California, was pioneered several years ago by a scheme called SETI at Home, a planetary search for signals beamed from space by putative extraterrestrials. This ongoing program harnesses the idle computers of volunteers to sift through data picked up by radio telescopes. SETI at Home's website says that 4 million people have now signed up and nearly 1.2 million years of computer time have been spent in the hunt. So far unsuccessful. That's my interjection at that. So I thought the article for myself was phenomenal. I thought, well, 
this really changes the internet used in a you know dispersed way in a way that calls up you know relies on complexity theory and distributed computing you know where many you know individual computers with limited computing capacities congregate together on almost a chaotic basis you know like a random chaotic basis to solve certain problems really you know creatively pioneers like a new form of scientific knowledge itself and it also means that very complex and important scientific and medical problems you know then have the possibility of being solved pluralistically and democratically and across national borders itself and it also means that you have like dead time in your computer when you're sort of off the computer itself but the computer itself is not absent and it decides not really to go to sleep it wants to be amused it has an autonomic nervous system and who's to say those individual computer screensavers aren't going together and having a sense of well compiling the data to solve a problem itself so there's such a really creative kind of correspondence between the notion of an autonomic nervous system as data centers and the development of distributed computing where you know there are many small computers each solving a minuscule part of a problem but taken together you get a breakthrough which takes what how many years 2000 computer years to do this yep Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's such a great insight. That I mean, that's fantastic. One's illegal, you know. One they're hunting Kaza down, and the other, of course, it's solving problems with science. Just depends on who in, whose interest is at stake in this. In some ways, that's really that's a just Kaza, yeah. So it allows your computer to be open for file sharing. So it's music that you download in the tracks. So if you want to steal music, I mean, <laughs> if you want to exchange music <laughs> outside of copyright you know, protection preventions and stuff, there's go Casa. And there's really great articles now about, you know, the, uh, like Hollywood is really chasing Casa down, right? And they were finding it very hard because, in fact, turns out that it's incorporated in a small island of what Vanu off the coast of Australia. Its programmers are in uh, Finland, but they say they gave away the code, the source code to someone else, and they either don't know where it is or they don't care to, <laughs> to tell anyone that it is. They just say the people left Finland, that was the last they saw them. So you have these kind of migratory computer coders hacking through Europe with the source code itself. It's you know marketed throughout the world itself. So as the Hollywood is driving the Hollywood producers who want copyright protection to make money, just completely crazy. Because here is, you know, like an idea of a corporation that in fact is not respecting the normal corporate rules of copyright prevention. It's a really, it's again, you know, like a real profound form of destabilization <coughs> of the internet itself. So I just wanted to start with those three stories because the stories themselves like that are really, what are we on now, Sadie Pine? The stories themselves are really interesting because the stories really represent the fact that the, like the implications, I think, of the internet and of software culture are just really beginning. And now to Sadie Plant, who all your eyes are on. The she said, I got to have this I didn't have this. OK, let me just go back for one sec. This is. Um, This is, um, let me go now, uh, let me, let's start the, let's uh, initiate the discussion of cyber sex with really like a reflection just on the end of, reflection on the end of the feminist theory of cyber sex, which is, you know, written by Sadie Plant herself. And it's part of the uh, section on, on cyber feminism I want to talk about just for a moment. It's called, On the Matrix, Cyber Feminist Simulations, article number 19 is page 325. So I just want to go from that to the section on cyber sex and really focus on Nina Wakeford and Randa Woodland herself. And Sadie Plant herself is like this really interesting theorist. I think she might have, if the websites are correct, Sadie Plant was at the University of Warwick and she's this incredibly intelligent and incredibly evocative thinker. And she's like really, you know, like a, I would say like a profoundly revolutionary thinker because from a feminist perspective, 
she is deeply and authentically thinking through the implications of cyberspace and the net itself. And she, you know, for her work attracted really great attention. In the mid 90s, she was uh, went almost, you know, from being a young professor to being given like really, a, really a major grant project, asked to set up a uh, cyber culture program at the University of Warwick. She was named like, you know, like a research professor of some sort as the director of it. And she had an incredible implication, has written a series of books on, you know, digital technology, which are really, really interesting and important. And she's also written most recently a book on, or like a critical book on, you know, situation of start. So she really is completely engaged and really interesting herself. And there was a good interview with Sadie Plant and Linda DeMent in this here. And I just, I just want to, she said in this project that she's doing, she says, well, the project that I, what's Linda's project, who the artist that she's working with, Linda Nance, says the one that began is an event where I collected body parts from women. They donated their body parts digitally, and I put those bits and pieces together to create little monsters. From that, I made a work that's really about monstrous femininity. It's like a black comedy. There are little monsters in digital videos, the various monsters' behaviors and stories, and medical information about the physiology of certain monsters itself. What kind of monsters? This is Linda, very fleshy female conglomerate. All the monsters are made up of women's body parts, the different body parts, they were conglomerates. And I just want to go down to Sid, Sadie has to say about this. She says, Sadie says, da -da, she says, she said what I wanted to do is start the book on digitality. It was really to try and correct what thought I thought was a great misconception in the moment about the relationship between women and computers in particular and technology in general. It seemed to me that a lot of orthodox feminist theory was still being very technophobic, like afraid of technology. Whereas in practice, the most interesting work in new media was actually being done by women who were far from being technophobic, in fact, seemed to have a particular intimacy with computers, which confounded existing feminist theory. It began as an attempt to try and set the record straight, but obviously things like setting records straight in a nonlinear world is not easy. So it has become a much more complicated project looking at, for example, the historical connection between women and machines, the way in which women have been effectively used as machine parts for the reproduction of the species, the way in which our conception of machines is now are now changing, moving away from machinery itself to, being to itself being to produce an existing world, and much more about replicating new worlds. And then they talk about the relationship of their work to one another itself. So Sadie Plant's work really just begins with this really f a fundamental perspective. And if you remember, like the end point of, you know, like a major point in Donna Haraway's work is that Donna Haraway herself that she says that she wants to really refuse what she called like identity theory, you know, like essentialisms. So she does want to have like an essentialist theory of race, an essentialist theory of gender, an essentialist theory of class. She really wants to open, oh, you know, like a new form of understanding up, which is for her feminist, cyber feminist, and which has characteristics like this. It's about you know, blurring boundaries. It's about porous <laughs> identities. It's about thinking of ourselves as not like just sort of these concrete unitary subjects, but as much more hybrid in character. And, you know, she sums it up, you know, I'd rather be a cyborg than a goddess. And when I read the article, I began to be a little suspicious because I had the feeling that maybe the image of the cyborg was the new feminist goddess for the 21st century. You know, that there was like a, like a return to like traditional forms of feminism itself. But I think what's latent in, in, Sadie ha in Donna Haraway's perspective is manifest in Sadie Plant's perspective on the matrix. Her perspective is like Haraway's in that she argues that shift in technology from industrial capitalism, which she says about industrial capitalism, she says industrial capitalism has a sex. And the sex of industrial <coughs> capitalism is that it's patriarchal. It's like male stream. It, you know, is a sex of surveillance. It's a sex which is gender coded, which is deeply gender coded itself, and you know fits into like what she calls like a fellow-centric perspective on the world itself. And in Donna Haraway and Sadie Plant both agreed that digital capitalism, this language which is different than industrial capitalism, this language of flows and networks and coding is really akin to a feminist perspective. That when you move from you know, what Topper would call the second phase of technology, from the phase of industrial capitalism to digital capitalism. With Negro Ponte, when we move into an era which is becoming digital, then you don't simply change technologies, you also speak shift the gender under which, within which the technology is coded itself. 
You slip from a world which is really dominated by male stream perspectives to potentially a world which is dominated by a woman's perspective, to a technology which really against its own interests and against its own desires is in fact something that is inherently <coughs> feminist. And this is the argument that both Donna Haraway and Sadie Plant want to make. They want to make the argument that technology has a sexuality, that industrial capital, you know, like the world of the organization of workplaces, which are tightly organized, which are hierarchical, which are about bureaucratic authority, which are technologies of surveillance and their control, also happens to correspond to you know, long history of the domination of women. And the domination of women, not simply in terms of whether you're in the workforce or outside the workforce, or whether you have political power or not, but a kind of domination which is much more intense than that. That is to say that women themselves in the age of industrial capitalism are forced to think of themselves as like little men, are forced to borrow a perspective on the world, which Donna Haraway and Sadie Plant would argue is basically a male stream way of thinking of the world, a loss of tactility, a loss of touch, an emphasis on the eye, a loss of, you know, an understanding of like hybrid life, like life is like, you know, like a weaving, like a lot of different things are going on at any given time and who cares whether it has a unity, your life has contradictions, so what? And in favor of life which has to have a unity itself. So the argument that they make is that, you know, in the age of industrial capitalism, the technology actually puts inside ourselves a way of seeing and a way of understanding ourselves which is gender specific which is a male way of understanding the world itself. You know, the technology begins to speak. And when it begins to speak, it's like with a guttural voice of a male that speaks itself. It's a male language that speaks. Now, Sadie Plant and Donna Harway make the argument that when you move to computer culture, and not just computer culture like hacker culture, but when you move to a world which is about, you know, networks and flows and distributed computing, the possibility exists that what we are really shifting in that world is in fact the gender which codes technology. That the technology suddenly has the possibility of being much more fluid and porous and hybrid, much more about open spaces, much more about unfinished tasks, much more about complexity, much more about distributed knowledge. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to be master of your kingdom you can also have partial knowledge. You can also have a kind of intimacy between like doing new media art in terms of your own creativity itself. You don't have to be at the center in a world of computer culture to be, have a central perspective. The margins also begin to speak. Now Donna Haraway and Sadie Plant asked the really interesting question. What kind of thought does this correspond to? Thought which is diffuse and porous and about hybrid and you know, partial identities, a kind of flows and things which are partial in character and you know, kind of doing coding like you would do the act of, you know, the original act of weaving itself. Whose language does that correspond to? And they answer it doesn't correspond to the old hierarchical mill language of heavy technology that the central powers have got control and everyone else is completely crushed and marginalized. It corresponds to a formal language which is to be found in the language of feminism itself. And you know, they don't really obviously quote overly quote in this article, but the sources of this perspective come out of France again. France is the source of a lot of great ideas. It comes out of a perspective called New French Feminism. Hélène Sixieux, Julia Kristeva, originates in Bulgaria but then comes to France. Uh, Lucia Rigre, a book called this, uh, The Sex Which Is Not One all of whom made a very common argument. They all made the argument really in the 60s, you know, as feminists struggling to find a voice of their own, that the problem that they were finding in having a voice of their own that as writers, that they began to write and they began to write as like little guys, like bigger little guys. They were forced to write in a language which was not their own. They were forced to think in categories that were not their own. They were forced to like exclude experiences which were their own. And they, in the act of writing, began a rebellion. I think they were like the first, I would call them hackers of writing in some ways. You know, they really broke the act of writing. They began to do these 
text which drove the, you know, the French Academy crazy. They began to write like poetry. They began to write fragments. They began to write like these beautiful kind of diffuse kind of words. And the words that they began, and then they began to give performances and to speak. And the performances that they gave were in fact about a woman's experience, an experience which is diffuse and porous and incomplete and about network flows and about a different form of language itself and which had a history, an unfinished realization of the history and about a possible future itself. Now a writer like Sadie Plant reads them and she says, well, this kind of writing, this kind of hacking writing, you know, hacking the act of writing to find like a space for to under, a space and language to understand a woman's experience in the world is really similar to what I am doing as a creative computer programmer and a media artist. Because as a woman, she says, I find like this kind of deep affinity between computer culture and software culture and myself. I find a kind of deep affinity because maybe I find myself in the matrix. And she says in page 333, she says in Greek, the word for womb is hystera. In Latin, the word for womb is matrix or matter, both the mother and the material. And then Sadie Plant begins to speak. Is it possible that the internet, that cyberspace, is not in fact big daddy any longer, but is in fact that the internet is mummy, that the internet is mother, that the internet has a gender itself, that it's the matrix. I'll just say one other. And so this article is written in 1996 and the technical facts of the article are out of date. They've been outpaced by technology itself. But the argument that she's making, whether technology is male stream or female stream, whether technologies have a gender is I don't think out of date. I think it's like a realization which is just really now coming to be debated itself. And it has incredible implications in terms of questions of you know, sexual politics and has really incredible implications in terms of releasing the creative possibilities of the net. Because it strikes me, you think like CASA, like isn't that CASA really a debate not just about file share, excuse me, file sharing versus copyright protection, which it certainly is. But isn't CASA, which it introduces an idea to the net, like a file sharing, which is really a feminist idea. The possibilities of forms of cooperative knowledge, of like, you know, diffuse flows of knowledge itself, of an actual form of technology that, you know, doesn't, isn't important because it has exchange value and property relations, but actually has use value, a tactility, touch, that you can in fact begin to do creative things. Like I know, for example, people working in, you know, the, you know, the paper factories of Toronto, for example, and in New York, who work late into the night in the various professions of the world as investment bankers. And they know that when they're doing their work, they're putting together their own CDs out of CASA. And while they're doing investment banking decisions late at night, what are they listening to? Rage against the machine. They're putting together, you know, industrial acid music itself and beginning to share these with others. So Sadie Plant would say, well, is it possible that against anyone's intentions, it's not a plot, it's not being carried on by a big social movement, but the technology is in fact creating another possibility for another form of knowledge, for another form of file sharing, for another form of, Sadie Plant would say, another form of mind sharing or body sharing itself. And is it possible, just possible, that that form of file sharing is in fact feminist? At least it seems like feminism in terms of how feminism has always described its project of liberation, its project of emancipation. It's certainly not daddy's no. You know, CASA is not a male stream project. Because the male stream projects tend to be pretty closed, pretty hierarchical, and always under, you know, under the screws of daddy's thumb in some ways. So Sadie Plant then wants to make this argument that in fact the technology itself, the, by its objective properties, might have something about it that is deeply feminist. And it might be a realization of a woman's way of understanding the world. It's really a radical proposition, Sasha. Essentialism, which refutes essentialism, refutes the concept, but then goes on to say that digital technology and 
describe her culture can bring about a radical shift from essential maleism to essential femininity, yep. which is exactly what. And I think it's a really great point. But it's, but it's, it's, it's a complete it's contradiction. contradiction. Yeah, it's, but culture. well, Haraway and, and Plant are different in this. Because Haraway, that's a really good criticism for Haraway. And she really should deal with that. For Plant, no, it's not a criticism. Plant would say, no, she's, Plant's less, you know, she has less about her of a language of, she's, she criticizes essentialism less than Haraway for a very good reason, because she has an essentialist perspective. She is really speaking of a new form of identity, which she is then, you know, fusing onto the net itself. So that would be less of, she would say, oh yeah, sure. This is, but this is, and she would say, because she's making a really radical argument, and that is that the software technology itself is creating a form of knowledge, which just of its own properties is feminist, against anyone's intentions and against property relations and you know male domination in this violent era we live in. Have a lot of male backlash, you know, when guys get you know frightened, you know, when the male ego gets destabilized and feels anxious because of the affirmative action, and there's a lot of women in universities and you know, in the job forcing of competition, you don't get, in that, you don't get in usually emancipatory guys and good feelings. You get real fears and you get male backlash and a lot of violence, which has certainly been, you know, that seems to be this story of our culture in some ways. Like the last American election, you could just track, it's not the, you could take the map and the map would also say, play, you know, it was like a gendered map, right? I mean, the Bush people knew in advance through their polling that they had really a strong majority of white males. Now, why did they have a strong majority of white males? Is there something about the previous administrations and the general movement of culture that threatened male privilege? You know, so they took, they could take, they put that in their back pocket and really, and they still take that for granted and, and um, appeal to that in terms of like, the, why do we have warlike policies? I mean, the policies in Iraq. Why is the machinery of power running on two tracks today? The populations around the world seem to be against invading Iraq. That, you know, they can't even get consensus at the United Nations. The population in the United States is split 50-50. And yet I pick up the paper yesterday and I listen to the television news and it says, for four months now they've been positioning, pre-positioning really heavy military wep weapons all around Iraq. And this is, you know, and the Kuwait already has anti-chemical defoliants and you know like all the apparatus and he said the only thing that's needed is to put the bodies there, the soldiers, and that'll be the last thing that they do. And I thought, what's happening? Is so I missed something here? You know that there's been a decision taken already and I'm sure the date's already been set basically for this. So it's like a machinery is at work. And Sadie Plant would say, well that machinery is essentialist. It really reflects a certain way of thinking about the world, which is let's not have cooperative relations, but warlike relations are better. And you can, you can just see the uh, electoral possibilities of that by virtue of the fact that in the states, the Democrats have had to get online in the Midwestern states particularly if they're not going to be wiped out in terms of this midterm election. So um, I think, of course. I don't find the internet especially, you know, structured to accommodate people the way I think. So, you know, I, I get frustrated when we do. No, that's really good. So what would that mean? What would the implications of that be then? Well, either they would say that I'm one of the little men and that's why I'm on the internet. <laughs> that makes you really angry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, and, you know. Yeah. So it would be like a put down, really. Yeah. yeah. But do you see any possibility, any credibility in her argument at all, though? For some people, sure, but not all women are the same. And, you know, like I was just saying, that this is women's experience and that this is feminism also, and that the internet is structured like feminism. Well, I don't agree with any forms of feminism that I've studied, but I still think I'm a feminist. So, That's you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're going to go over here and then Ted. Well, I was just wondering, going back to this idea of essentialism, and I don't know if you have this closely down with the sort of practical and everyday experiences, but I mean, isn't part of what she's saying that there, 
isn't really properly teaching an essentialist feminine identity, that aren't they saying that sort of the history of women's identity has always been a displaced identity? Mm. And so in a sense, to to be counter a male essentialism isn't necessarily to be pro a female essentialism. It's, I mean, because that sort of woman's identity from the start has always been one of deferral and displacement, and and it's not a homogenous identity, rather a really fractured and diverse sort of identity that does conflict, and that's okay. And so I'm wondering if, if that in some ways doesn't address the idea that that uh, maybe it's not sort of a counter-essentialist in some sort of sense. Sasha. Well, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's, I agree with you that it's okay, but I think that displacement is what brought upon essentialism, and essentialism does subscribe to as deep as some form of essential femininity, that's why it started through through the political structures in Poland that have, for some, for many reasons, and for many other reasons, made women feel that at the same time they had to celebrate and lament the state of femininity and find some kind of common cohesion in this historical structure. So I'm not sure I understand exactly what her take on essentialism is, but it's she's saying that she does consider herself an essentialist feminist, but I don't no, wait. Think yeah, but, no, but I, I shouldn't have said that because I wouldn't have meant that when I said that. I would just say that my own reading of her work is that she would be closer to what I would consider an essentialist perspective. Sadie might say, well, that's, that's certainly not my perspective at all. She might say what Ted said, which I think is nice, is that women's identity has never existed. It waits to be created. It's that's been... Essentialist feminism. I mean, that's not at least my understanding of what essentialist feminism is. Yeah. Essentialist feminism believes that there is an essential femininity and that it may be subordinated and displaced and on the back burner to male committee, but there is certainly a common cohesive true femininity. That's how I understand essentialist feminism. Yeah. Well, think about, I'll just give one, just if you want to give a well, quote. Maybe you want to comment on that, because I just want to say something about that. Yeah. Well, th think of what she says itself. When she says, in relation to Homo's page 327, she's talking about the specular economy. She's trying to describe what like a male stream economy would be. She said, this is the first discovery that patriarchy is not a construction or an order or a structure, but an economy for which women are the first and founding commodities. Women signs commodities and currency pass from man from one man to another, and women are supposed to exist, quote, only as the possibility of transference or of transition, or page 327. In relation to Homo sapiens, she is the foreign body, the immigrant from nowhere, the alien without, and the enemy within. Women can do anything and everything except be herself. Her outlaw state is always remains within herself. She never signs up. She doesn't have the equipment. Male subjects are the ones who see, those whose gaze defines the world. Women are a whole, a shadow, a wound, a sex that is not one. Women are hunted as witches. They're denounced by Freud as hysterics. They're repressed. They're made absent. She says, either way, page 327, Women is left without a sense of self and identity which accrued to the masculine. How can she speak without becoming the only speaking subject conceivable to men? How can she be active when activity is defined as the male? How can she design her own sexuality when even this has been defined for those for whom the phallus is the, phallus is the central core? She says, today the economy has radically shifted by the late 20th century, all patriarchies, media, tools, commodities, and lines of commerce and communication and on, on and as which they circulate have changed beyond recognition. Modern feminism is marked by the emergence of networks and contacts which need no centralized organization and evade its structures of command and control. We live in the age of the global net. Genders can be bent and blurred and time-space coordinates tend to be lost. The net is an anarchic, self-organizing system into which its users fuse. The net is becoming cyberspace, the virtuality with which the not quite ones have always felt themselves to be in touch. Today, the electronic world is all about self-organizing systems, complexity, decentralization, parallel distributed processing, self-replicating program. This is not a model of patriarchy, but a space where new subjects can speak. So I think in like this kind of really diffuse, interesting way, she's trying to say, is it possible that the technology itself opens up a language for a different sexuality and a different form of knowledge to be articulated and spoke? Does it change the subject of this 
Does it change the nature of the speaking subject itself? And I'll just conclude. She says that women have always recognized the danger and possibility of technology. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is about post-human post, post light, life. Ada Lovelace wrote the software for the 1840s analytical machine. Grace Murray Hopper wrote the operating program for the first computer. She argues, and this is Plant, that the computer is a woman. She says, like Irigaray's women, it can turn its invisible, non-existent self to anything. It runs any program and simulates all operations, even those of its own functioning. This is the woman who doesn't know yet what she wants and cannot say what she is or what she thinks, and st still persists as though elsewhere, what were you thinking? Everything. And finally she asks, aren't neural net functions identical to hysteria? Aren't they like intuitive leaps and cross connections, a lack of inhibition and control? And isn't the act of programming itself very much like an old woman's craft, the craft of weaving? Isn't in fact the act of programming, like what a friend of mine, Michael Darnell, who used to teach here, who's teaching in New Brunswick, said, isn't the act of programming very much like needlepoint? You know, aren't there's a kind of craft knowledge involved in these, and isn't the craft knowledge to which they refer sort of a woman's craft knowledge itself? So I just think that city plant, in like a general way, is just trying to pose the question, what is the kind of nature of knowledge that's being presented? Like this thing of, you know, like the solution through distributed computing of a real problem of proteins, of folding proteins. You know, that kind of problem cannot be posed in a society which is under the do domination of traditional patriarchal male stream thought. Because it has qualities and values about it which are excluded. Which is to say, it has qualities of anarchy, qualities of the value of distributed knowledge, qualities of cooperation, and qualities of caring. Those aren't qualities typically that you associate with a patriarchal society. And Sadie Plant would then say the question, call it feminism, but call it what you will. But isn't the possibility exist that this form of knowledge resembles in its fluidity and hybrid identities and respect for caring and possibilities of cooperation and in its anarchy, a form of thought that we traditionally, in fact, have associated with feminism itself, with, in fact, a suppressed woman's way of understanding the world. Isn't it possible that the technology objectively is creating the conditions for a real shift of power of genders, you know, or at least for like a regendering of the world in some ways? And isn't the real area where we cross over, you know, where the boundary shifts are occurring, isn't this at the level of sexuality itself? Is it possible that when feminism is being smashed downwards and really denounced by most people as being out of date or, you know, you know, we've moved on to other things, it's impossible, just sort of ironically, that in fact, that feminism is being carried forward silently and invisibly by the language of technology itself. So that's Sadie Plant's, you know, like cyber feminist theory, you know, feminist theory of cyberspace itself. And sort of she puts a radical proposition and she both puts the question and she answers it. To the question, does technology have a sex? She answers yes. And she says the sex of technology is, in fact, the sex of women. She says it's the sex of femininity. So for myself, that's really to be thought about because it opens up the possibility for an understanding of media, technology, and politics, which isn't within the language of patriarchy or within the language of male stream thought itself. But in a patriarchal culture, is it, of course, possible to speak in any way that is not patriarchal itself? And so that's the question that it, that Sadie Plant puts. And sorry. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to like I find the perspective and the sort of the implications of what she offers ideas that you know really positive ones like interesting and convenient to read. And she sort of speaks of in general like Western views of things, but I think that it's almost besides the point for someone to try and gender it to disprove that it's one gender and say it's another, rather than just sort of accept the fact that they're not Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's like 
manipulated by us. We, we plug into it, but it also like manipulates us in return. So it's like power structures that go from like you know uh, from like the uh, submissive to the dominant all throughout it, like at every level. So yeah. you can basically reduce anything to saying it's something like you know the, the vegan metaphor. I mean, pretty much any any strategy. such a technique that's per se it's like using a military strategy which is by very its very definition like an aggressive male oh i think so that's really good i think it's like important to like maybe start start thinking like rather than in the gender like getting trapped to the gender argument to try and like consider it as like something new a new i mean it's based on binary which is both one and zero so it's not just one or the other it's yeah, that's a really good, as you're saying, it's a really interesting perspective. That maybe what's happening, in fact, with the, you know, the cyber technology is that, in fact, it's post-gender. And has possibilities, like, takes Donna Harway really, or other thinkers really seriously, that against their own intentions and maybe against their own desires, that the technology itself has these very opposite qualities. Because I think it's exactly true, because I would say, that from the point of view of the U.S. cyberspace military, that they could read this argument and say, oh, we could find a home here. We like neural networks. We like distributed computing. We like the flows of the network. We like like the FBI's Echelon program. We very much like, like little back doors put in computers, and we like following these flows. We like seeing where they lead. We like the notion of electronic traces and following that. And not from any particularly liberatory point of view, but in terms of you know, heightened surveillance itself. So the very same technology then has really quite radically different possibilities and different turnings. And why not? Why is the would the net then just have two genders? Why couldn't it have a thousand genders? You know, why in fact can't you have a culture in which there's a lot of boundaries which are being shifted all the time and a lot of crossings over that are taking place? Because you know, in the next article is the World Treat. You know, don't just ask with Sadie Plant or Donna Harway about the notion of the internet and feminism. They say, well, what are the implications of the internet for gay culture? What are the implications of the feminism of the internet for lesbian culture? And in the next section, cyber colonization, they're going to ask the question, well, what is the implications of the internet for things like identity tourism and for you know developing virtual communities versus real democratic communities? So those are real possibilities itself really good insight. And this would go back to your really good insight that you can find things in you know this perspective that seem agreeable, but speaking as a woman, you don't want to agree with this form of feminism and say in fact she might speak of porous identities, but you don't particularly feel that. And so does that mean you're any less a feminist than Sadie Plant? And the answer would have to be no. The answer would have to be in fact you're forming another form of feminism, you know, like beginning to articulate another form of feminism. Like <coughs> Okay. <coughs> Any questions or are you following this? <coughs> yes or no? Guys? <laughs> the guys have stayed remarkably silent here, except for Sasha and others. Yeah. So any what's your general feeling about this? <coughs> Be honest. <coughs> <laughs> no. <coughs> no responses are forthcoming itself. So. Do you think it's at all fair to say that technologies have a gender. <coughs> the technologies could be male stream. I don't agree with that. You don't, that's good. And could you say why you don't agree with that? Not really, but <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I don't think I don't see how the technology could have a gender per se as being something that sets you know the new frontier of what I don't know why I would use that word. Yeah. <laughs> so it in which way would it be more at men and women? Sorry? In which way would it be more at men than at women? Uh, I don't know, various aspects of uh, <laughs> 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 oh, oh, the euphemisms, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, uh, gaming culture. Is gaming culture a feminist activity generally? I can see, you know, there'd be a 
there's a strong tradition of feminism is really interested in gaming culture. And it's, well, just sort of like virulent war games itself. I'm sort of making up a tradition. But Sadie Plant is, and the artists that she works with are really are. Because their their perspective is they're not <coughs> like these, they're not male bashers in any way. They say, well, yeah, there's a lot of violence on the net. And so why can't women participate in cultures of violence as well? You know, like this kind of virtual violence. Like we're, she's not articulating a position for kind of a soft feminism. She's saying, why can't we be active agents on the net as well? Why can't we sort of in, you know, speak about the language of viral agents and coding and warrior languages itself? Why can't we be cyber warriors? Why do you always have to be shut down? Yeah, but Sadie Plant, it's my fault, because Sadie Plant is much more ambiguous on this. Sadie Plant is trying to articulate a very conservative idea, from my perspective, of feminism. And that is a feminism which is like separated from a feminist project. You can think of the people that she calls like Lucy Arigiri and Lynn Six you know, like New French Feminism really had a, you know, they weren't just writing, they had a political project. And the political project was this, they said, in our bodies and our minds, we are shut down. We go to speak and we can only find ourselves, we can publicly speak in a male language about a male experience. We've never in our life been able to speak about a woman's experience, just in, an in a kind of authentic way, about the things that have concern for us. We've never been able to think of the world through like the pores of a woman's body. We've always had to think ourselves through the male gaze upon ourselves. We've always had to have the alienated perspective. And at some point, they said, no way, we refuse. We are really going to try to you know, develop a form of writing, or it could be a form of art, or it could be a form of, you know, media practice of any sort that begins to articulate the way that we feel. Why does our writing have to have a beginning point and an ending point? Why can't we write in fragments? And why can't we speak about bodily flows? Why can't we speak about a woman's body? Why can't we speak about love and hate in the same sentences? Why can't we articulate and bring to like privileged experiences which are central to our experience about the suppression of our bodies and how we always have to know our bodies medically through what, you know, Lucy Rigaway would say is like, you know, scopophiliac, like the ideology of the gaze, or another book, you know, the speculum of the other. You know, why do our bodies, to know our bodies medically, why do they always have to move through like, you know, basically what seem to be male torture devices, you know, which every woman in this room has experienced. These aren't, you know, we don't have a medical practice which has been very much informed by a woman's experience. It's a generally a male-oriented practice, right to this day. Read, you know, the Royal Commission on Reproductive Technologies. Bang, you know, it's done by women, but it's just bang man, man thought. It's, you know, just male stream of thought right on. It doesn't ask, you know, critical questions about, doesn't seem to ask too many critical questions about reproductive technology. So these writers say, well, is it possible to think of a, a woman's identity in a way that isn't essentialized? You're not trying to say it's the only identity. You're saying it is an identity, and it deserves some space to be thought in its own authenticity, and therefore it needs its own way of articulating itself. You know, I remember when I gave a talk down at the University of Florida once. It was on, it was Mary Louise and myself. It was to a group of architects, large audience of architects, and we got up. And the women that I was on the panel with were these great architects. There were three women, Mary Louise, and myself. I was the only guy on the panel. And at some point in the panel, the, yeah, I'll turn this off. Let me just tell the story. Let's sort of kind of, on the panel, we're suddenly at some point, you know, like, like architects are like these, like sculptors. Like traditionally, the, the tradition of sculpting has been like the male mako profession, in my experience. Well, architects until recently seem to be the same way. You know, the big penial buildings go up. And you know, say, oh, it's not exactly, it seems to be like a